So thank you very much for, for joining today. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our, our special guest speaker today, Manfred Schartel, um, who's a famed cancer biologist, a fish molecular biologist and geneticist, uh, evolutionary biologist, and uh, a genomics scientist. So um, Manfred gave his uh, a, a, a sort of a career overview talk. I think many of you attended. So I won't give his uh, full biography, but originally from Germany, uh, he told us how he wanted to start off by looking at butterflies, but then quickly decided that genetics and so on was, was his thing and went into fish. And he be first became a group leader at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Munich uh, before becoming a professor of biochemistry at the University of Würzburg, uh, where he's been for uh, uh, most of his career. And he's also a scholar in residence at, the, uh, at Texas State University. Um, I know Manfred because he, he is famous for uh, sequencing the largest animal genome. Uh, 14 times the size of the human genome. And actually in this room, we've got the person who sequenced the smallest animal genome. So we've got the smallest and largest. It's about, I don't know. Yeah, yes. So I think it's about 500 times difference, is it? Between yours and yours. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, very surprising animals in the sea. So anyway, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for coming today and over to you. Does it work? Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure. And of course, it's an honor to come to OIST, which is a world renowned institution, and of course there are a few people and friends in the auditories, in, which I know since a lot of time, and I've been looking forward to my visit. I have to say, I so far I enjoyed every minute. Okay, so... Yeah, I choose this, um, yeah, this, this headline because I guess um, many of you are working on model organisms and uh, we all in the auditory, we always have to justify that our model organism is really something which is uh, useful for learning something. And... Uh, I don't know why this doesn't work. The Xephophorus model is a fish which uh, originally lives in the waters of Mexico and it has been taken from these waters already almost 100 years ago. So the first publications on these fish as a cancer model are from 1928, and then it has been taken to the laboratory, the fish room, and of course our goal is to learn, to understand, and finally make use so that it will benefit uh, the patients and human medicine. So just to remind us uh, about what a good research organism should, yeah, thank you should do for you. So usually we, these are a number of, of uh, criteria. And in the best case, all the criteria should be fulfilled. Yeah, it should be well suited for the laboratory, easy to breed, genetically defined strains, economic. An elephant is not a good laboratory animal. So it's, 
And this is important to have research tools, especially in cancer research, we need cell lines, antibodies, molecular probes. In our days, genomic resources are a must. I don't have to mention that. What is good, but in a lot of cases we are lacking is an active research community. Some model organisms have hundreds of labs, and then a lot of this uh, is, um, is a lot of exchange publicly accessible databases. Of course, a research project should be feasible to convince uh, people to give you the money. And there should be opportunities for funding, which is not always the same. And then, of course, you, you want to have functional assays, transgenesis, uh, knockout, genome modification, all this. And then the question is, yeah, if you have all this, is still your research organism valid. And there are three criteria, and I will hopefully show you that Xiphophorus fulfills these criteria. So the first is the phase validity, meaning does a model replicate the human disease clinical findings? And so in, that's special for, for disease models. There is the predictive validity, meaning that the model can predict currently unknown aspects of human disease. Just don't want to repeat and find in your model what people have found in human and uh, patient materials already. And the last one is a construct validity, meaning that do the molecular, genetic, cellular, and physiological mechanisms in the model reflect the mechanisms of the human disease, which is very difficult in a lot of cases, especially if the model is they're only distantly related to humans or not at all. And this is something which is a lot of times questions by, by clinicians and medical doctors, especially when they review your papers or your grants. Okay, so having all this said, you would say, okay, yeah, we have such models. We have the zebra fish or we have the mouse. Uh, some people even use Drosophila for uh, disease research, uh, but these two models, and I call them the domesticated models, they have some drawbacks because in zebrafish and especially in zebrafish, but also in mouse, mutagenesis screens identify usually only monogenic traits with very strong phenotypes. That's how it works. And also transgenesis and and knockout strategies produce phenotypes due to a single genetic change. In a lot of cases, the mouse is very healthy. You have to knock out a gene or you make it transgenic and all those are zebrafish, so that these animals become sick. So the process of the disease is in this case already kind of an artificial process. Okay, so the problem is Human diseases, on the other hand, they range from very simple. So we have a monogenic diseases, but they have a lot of complex uh, characters, like diseases which are polyfactorial. They have strong phenotypic variation. There is epigenetic modification and environmental influence. So these are the limitations of the domesticated models for studying pleiotropy and multigen phenotypes, variable expressivity of a trait and variable penetrance, and also for environment genotype interactions, these models are not really well suited, at least in my opinion. So what can we do? So there is a way out, which is provided by the so-called evolutionary mutant models of human disease. So these are models where an adaptive uh, evolved phenotype mimics a human disease phenotype. And I will explain you in a minute what I mean with this. It means that some mutation which occur in wild populations of animals, which are favored by natural selection are similar to those mutations that contribute to human disease. And one of these models is uh, the fish Xiphophorus. These fish live in uh, Central America, mainly in Mexico and Guatemala. 
they have evolved uh, 26 different species and all these species can be um, hybridized still. We have a, a very good genome. It is a model for disease drivers, all these uh, pleiotropic uh, gene and phenotype uh, modifiers. As I said, we can produce interspecific hybrids. We have inbred lines. There is an enormous genotypic variety from wild populations. And uh, there is also a stock center. So we have extensive genomic uh, resources and we have the bioinformatic tools. Why do we choose Xiphophorus as a research organism? The disease that we are concerned with is malignant melanoma. Ma malignant melanoma is uh, a skin cancer. It's a rare cancer in, in Africans and Asian people, but in the Caucasians, uh, it's the, the fifth most worldwide and the sixth most frequent cancer in men in the US. And it's the most, um, most aggressive skin cancer. It's responsible for about 75% of skin cancer deaths. And the survival with one some uh, metastases have developed are pretty low. There are some uh, upcoming treatments, immunotherapy and small molecule inhibitors. And I will talk about this a little bit later because the benefit for the patients is still low. Okay, so why Xiphophorus and why melanoma? As I said about uh, 100 years ago, geneticists found out if you cross a female of the platyfish Xiphophorus maculatus, which exhibits these little spots in the dorsal fin, and these spots are made up of a giant type of, of melanophores, which is called the macromelanophores. I will talk about this a little later. And um, yeah, so there, this is the Phophorus maculatus, and we cross it with a distantly related species, the sorttail, Xiphophorus helleri, and this uh, species does not have the spots in the dorsal fin. That's the trick. And then we get an F1 hybrid, so I'm, I'm back to, to high school Mendelian genetics. So we have the F1 hybrid, and this F1 hybrid also had an, has an enhanced pigmentation in the dorsal fin, though it's larger, but this is a kind of a benign lesion. These fish are fully healthy. And uh, then we do a back crossing. We cross again to this spotless sword tail, and then we get an, a back cross generation, which uh, segregates into uh, about 25% of the fish which have inherited the spotting locust, and they develop malignant melanoma, which at the end kills the fish. 25% of the fish look like the F1 hybrids. They have the more benign lesion, and uh, these 50% which have not inherited the pigmentation, you know, they, they are indistinguishable phenotypically. And what has been found already <clears throat> many years ago is this the following genetic explanation. Geneticists uh, postulated that this fish has on one chromosome a tumor locus which promotes the macromelanophore growth, but it does not develop a malignancy because on a different chromosome it has kind of a tumor suppressor, a regulator locus, which is called R, which keeps this tumor gene in, in check. The phosphorus helleri does not have the spots, so it doesn't have the tumor gene. And of course, this was a postulation. It does not have the regulatory genes because it doesn't need it. Then the F1 hybrid is heterozygous for both genes uh, because they are on different chromosomes. That's very important. And what we do here is we substitute in the backcross generation the chromosome which has the suppressors, a regulatory locus by a suppressor-free chromosome brought in from Cephophorus helleri. 
And then 25% of the fish will have inherited the tumor gene, but they have no copy of the regulator. And then the whole malignant function of the tumor gene becomes apparent and the fish uh, develops melanoma. This fish is genotypically and phenotypically like the F1, and this is the rest of it. That this is true, at least this is an old genetic experiment. What we can do is we can take such fish, sometimes they get fertile, and we cross them again with a fish that brings in this regulatory loci. And then as you can see, the F1 hybrid has already a more mild phenotype. And then after back cross generation, we get really healthy fish again, which have only these spotting. So this is the classic Gordon Coswick Anders crossing, the reintroduction of the R locus reverts the malignant phenotype. It means that it's obviously true that the crossing condition elimination of a suppressor or a modifier leads to activation of the tumor gene and that there is no further genetic change required for the development of malignant melanoma, which in cancer research is a very big advantage for us because if you induce cancer by treating the animal with carcinogens or with x-rays, you will never produce the same lesion again in an independent experiment. But we can always, when we go back to melanoma, which we have frozen in the minus 80, 20 years ago, and do an RNA seq and do it from a fish of today, they are the same. So it's a very stereotypic and repeatable um, experiment. This helps a lot. Okay, so the tumor locus TU. That's what we found many years ago encodes a gene which we called XMERC. The XMERC is a uh, yeah, short form for Xiphophorus melanoma receptor tyrosine kinase. This uh, XMERC gene and protein is overexpressed in melanoma, and the expression level correlates with the degree of malignancy. So the more of the proteins there, the more malignant the tumor and which was very in helpful for us is that XMERG is a local duplication of a gene that is very well known, namely the epidermal growth factor receptor, which is frequently affected in many tumors of animals and humans and uh, all of the biochemistry, which we did, we could uh, yeah, somehow copy experiments that were already done biochemically for the, uh, human EGF or mouse EGF receptor. What makes XMERG a tumor gene has two reasons. One is during the duplication process, XMERG has gained a new upstream region on the chromosome. I'm not going into detail, but this new upstream region uh, guarantees that this gene is only expressed in pigment cells. So that's why we only see melanoma. Uh, and it has also several mutations. And these mutations are in the extracellular domain of the receptor. So these are two monomers of XMERC. And uh, here, and obviously up there, are mutations which finally lead to the formation of intramolecular cysteine bridges between these two monomers. So this thing always is stuck together. And this has an important biochemical uh, consequence. This is a wild type receptor like the EGF receptor. Monomer sits in the cell membrane, then epidermal growth factor is bound which leads then to dimerization of the receptor. And only if the receptor is dimerized, we see these cross autophosphorylation. And only in this form, the receptor is active and it leads to a ligand dependent signaling. So everything is regulatable. If there is no EGF, there is no signal and the signal of epidermal growth factor receptor is proliferation that cells should divide. Now, oops, 
Uh, this is Xmark, and Xmark has uh, a, has a mutation which takes away one of these cysteines, which is exchanged against another amino acid, meaning that such an intramolecular cysteine bridge, which usually stabilizes the 3D structure of the receptor, cannot form. And it means that one of these cysteine here is sticking out. It's not bound. And then when a second receptor molecule meets in the, in the cell membrane, we get an intra an intermolecular cysteine bridge, meaning that this structure mimics the ligand bound situation, and then this leads to constitutive signaling, which is a permanent internal transduction to the cell to go into proliferation and do a lot of other things, which I will tell you in a minute, which, which makes the neoplastic transformation, the transition of a normal pigment cell to a malignant cell, which is quite a complicated process, as you will see what's going on here. But just to go a little bit back uh, more conceptually, we found XMERC through a forward genetic approach, which was kind of chromosome walking and candidate genes Remember, this was a, a few decades ago. Um, so the question then, which was asked to us, and which of course we have, uh, also wanted to know is, how do we know that XMERG is indeed a critical component of the tumor locus? At that time, chromosomes were so large for us, it was un, um, unthinkable that one day we could sequence whole chromosomes. It was just a thing. So the, the, the answer to the question again came from genetics because uh, although at that time there was no restriction of the number of animals that you can keep and although not a, a number of, of strains. So we were keeping some interesting strains. And because we had many, suddenly in one of our pre-reading uh, tanks, we saw a fish like that. And the fish which are in this thing should all look like that. They should have developed melanoma, but this one didn't have. So there was no melanoma. And when we took the female and were breeding it for generations, never is a melanoma reappeared. And then we sequenced the Xmerg oncogene locus from this fish. And what we found is that in this fish, uh, non-autonomous non transposon, which we call taxi one was inserted in one of the exons of XMERC, meaning that we had a gene disruption as just by, as, as by incidence. So it was a natural mutation that occurred. And this tells us, of course, that XMERC is necessary for melanoma formation. So if it's uh, not expressed, there is no melanoma. And then the second question is, is it also sufficient to make melanoma? And for this, usually you can do it transgenic, but now we come to the point that no model is perfect. In our case, these are life bearing fish and still today we have no way of making, no good way of, of, of manipulating the gene. So what I, we did at that time, I. Besides, this was a time when I first met uh, Daniel Chou because he was the first one who made a transgenic fish. It was a, a trout, a little bit too big for us, but they also worked on, on Medaka. So, because and as Medaka is much closer related to Xiphophorus, we choose the Medaka fish. And what we did, we took the Xmark gene, put it under um, a pigment cell specific promoter introduced this into healthy medaca. And luckily enough, we have a strain where this high penetrance, these fish now develop melanoma, telling us that Xmerg is also sufficient to induce melanoma. And aside, it gave us a very nice um, tool for, for other studies, things that we can only do with trans. Okay, as I mentioned, it's, um, for a model, it's also very important to have cell lines and 
to be able to do biochemistry because of course we were interested how is exmeric transforming the pigment cell how does it make a melanoma on the biochemical and cellular level and uh, what you see here is the a summary of many PhD and postdoc years doing the finding out how signal transduction of Exmerg is working. And these are all, at least for cell biologists, well known proteins and enzymes. And Exmerg, uh, like the EGF receptor, there is what we call the signalosome, it's a bunch of proteins which bind to the tyrosine phosphorylated intracellular part. And there are there is a pathway which induces anti-apoptosis. So these cells cannot die even if they are overproducing. Then the main thing here is the so-called ras ras map kinase cascade, which is inducing proliferation. So this map kinase if it's activated by this pathway, locates into the nucleus, activates cell proliferation genes. It also inhibits the differentiation. So the pigment cell stays in an early undifferentiated stage where it is uh, able to, to, to proliferate. And it also does a few other things. Angiogenesis, I will not talk about this. So the growth of new vessels in the tumor is regulated and survival, migration, these are all important points. And there are also another a group of proliferation regulators, which I've uh, mentioned like uh, P53, the retinoplastoma gene, MYC and so on. All of this is activated. So Xmerg yeah. is really upstream of classical human melanoma pathways that we also know from immune. In the meantime, it's a very potent and a strong oncogene. And uh, uh, a colleague has done a very nice experiment for us in zebrafish. He has taken the XMAC gene, but he put it under a, a liver specific promoter. And what he gets is liver cancer, which is uh, yeah, showing how potent these uh, epidermal growth factor receptor molecules are in manipulating the cell. Okay, so. One story that I should tell is that, as I told you, this is the so-called uh, mitogenic cascade, which we found, you can see here, a malignant and benign tumors. This uh, Exmerg is highly active in the highly malignant and also the downstream cascade. And uh, we knew this early on. This is now 25 years, at least. Uh, ago, we published that this uh, oncogenic receptor tyrosine kinase is activating the MAP kinase pathway. And uh, this was pigment cell research, which is a, a, a good journal in the field, but maybe many people didn't read it, I don't know. And it was... Five years later, the Nature paper was publishing that mutations of the BRAF gene. Yeah? So this is the downstream cascade of Xmerg are responsible for human melanoma. And it's, it's indeed the case more than 50% of human melanomas have a mutation in this pathway. So this was predicted from our model long before it was found in humans. Okay, so, and, and it's more so what, of course, in the meantime, we have done a lot of transcriptomes and the meta-analysis of all these transcriptomes shows us that the fish melanoma and the human melanoma, that on the molecular level, they are very comparable. So all the changes are there. And this even helped to identify from these uh, transcriptomes and the meta-analysis new uh, markers for human melanoma. So this gene we found was elevated in the fish malignant melanoma, 
This is a study on human cell lines. This is a normal pigment cell, several cell lines, which also overexpress this marker. And this is a microarray from human uh, tumor samples. And again, this, this gene is high in all the malignant and only in a few are absent in the precursor lesions. And another point which uh, made us really happy was the question is what we have, our model, is this a joke of nature or, uh, or is it anyway artificial at all? Because these two species which we use do not meet in nature. But then uh, it's only a few years ago, it was found that two species of this 26 um, species of Xiphophora, they are sympatric and they produce hybrids. And in fact, you can find these melanomas out in the waters of Mexico. So it's also a natural model. Uh, what I will concentrate for the rest of my talk is this question, because we, we, we know everything about Exmerg and how the melanoma is made after many years. So the more interesting question is, uh, what is the transition of malignancy? As I've shown you, we have 50% uh, of our uh, fish with Exmerg, they have these benign lesions where pigment cells are only in the epidermis. And these fish are always healthy, they live with them. While the malignant melanoma is highly invasive, so this is a melanoma, this is the underlying musculature. And as you can see, it grows inside and takes care of uh, the, the death of the fish. And this is a situation which is also known in humans. We know that uh, these lesions which develop into a melanoma, they can sit in your epidermis for many years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and they have a very slow radial growth because usually when a pigment cell is translocated to the dermis because of a trauma, it dies, it undergoes apoptosis. But then after many years, and this is something which no one knows how this is regulated in detail, suddenly these pigment cells can break through into the dermis and from there they go into the lymph system and metastasis starts. So this is the initial step to malignancy. And we have this situation also in our fish. So this is a fish with early uh, vertical uh, radial growth phase. So we have a few spots here, but the fish is nice. And then suddenly this is the same fish five weeks later and it's full of melanoma and uh, yeah, prone to, to die. As you can see, these fish are highly uh, yeah, colonized by tumor cells. So what is the mechanism behind? The mechanism that I explained to you is this self-protection mechanism, which all, at least vertebrates seem to have. The extracellular matrix in which the pigment cell is located consists of a lot of uh, uh, proteins, but the main protein is collagen and it's collagen one. And what happens if and this is the melanocytes. The melanocyte has uh, two proteins, which are called integrins, integrin alpha five and beta three, which are specific for melanocytes. They are sitting on the outside of the cells. And if they come in contact with fragments of collagen one, this integrin starts to signal it binds focal adhesion kinase, which activates protein kinase C. And this uh, leads to apoptosis, which is an endogenous suicide program of the cell. Meaning that if a pigment cell gets into the dermis, which is full of collagen, it will die. Uh, and so, so that's a good way to protect. So obviously when the vertical growth phase melanoma cells occur, so when the transition occurs, there must be a way how they can escape this. And we have done a lot of experiments without going into details, but we found that the Xmark transformed cells secreted 
secrete a glycosylated protein, which we call osteopontin. And then we established a cell culture system. As you see, it's always important if you want to go in a certain depth to have cell cultures. So we made a three-dimensional collagen matrix. And if we put melanocytes, fish, mouse, human, into this collagen matrix, we see what they expected. They will undergo apoptosis and they die. If we add a cell um, medium uh, supernatant from our Xmark transformed cells or the osteopontin protein, the cells can survive and they grow happily in culture. We looked at human melanoma cells to see if they express osteopontin, all of them do. There was one which didn't, but then my postdoc went back to the literature Oops. and could show that this melanoma was from a radial growth phase melanoma. So uh, that worked. Okay, so what uh, what happens in in Xmerk transformed cells or all melanoma cells, obviously, uh, we have the integrin beta and alpha system, which normally would now die when the, they meet the collagen. But the melanoma cells, they produce osteopontin, and osteopontin can bind to the integrin receptor meaning that it's blocking this receptor system and then there is no signaling and no apoptosis. And this is something that uh, was first found in Xiphophorus and then has made it to the clinic. It became a valuable diagnostic marker for human malignant melanoma. And so it's uh, also another um, indication that this uh, model system is, is used. So that is the phenotype, but the question is for this transition from benign to malignant, what keeps benign tumors in a benign state? So why do we have these fish which never develop melanoma all their life? What is the action of this famous or yeah, mysterious R local? And I can tell you, I'm still not knowing the answer, but I will guide you through the story at the end. Okay, uh, the problem which we have in cancer research is that these cancer initiating driver genes are not benefiting patients. So we know that almost all tumors have a mutation in the RAS gene and it doesn't help at all. If you talk to a pathologist, they will tell you that no two cancers are the same. Even patients which have the same mutation in the same mut uh, mutant driver gene can have a totally different course of the disease. They may react differently to uh, drugs. One may die early, one may die late, others metastasize. There is a lot of on going on, which we all sum summarize under the terms tumor evolution, genetic background effect, and which finally asks for this personalized medicine. And what we know is that the genetic background contains so-called tumor modifier genes, genes which are not primarily involved in making the tumor. These are the driver genes, but they determine the course of the disease. So our R locus is such a, a tumor modifier gene, and they are difficult to find because usually they are pleiotropic, they have individual specific effects, they provide only a partial phenotype. We are talking again about what I showed you in the beginning, why the evolutionary mutant models could be very important. And only few of these modifiers have been isolated or detected so far. This is one of the examples which we have in our fish. So this is a strain where the fish start to develop melanoma at four weeks. And everything looks, looks like we, we know it from the classical cross. But these are the same three fish one year later and the melanoma is gone. So there is a modifier that takes care and we know that this works on the immunological level, but we have not 
finally identified it. We have a, a whole bunch of other tumor modifiers which we have found so far. All of them have only weak effects, but we find them again when we look at human tumors. So this is a panel of human tumors. We find that they are also mutated, affected in a subset, a few percent. But again, so how can we use the Xifopro system to understand better and how can we find the R gene? Remember, these fish have the R locus, these fish don't. And what we are doing, or have been doing with colleagues is we do modern genetics, we do genome-wide association studies, we sequence the genome, and then we select, we, we look uh, which part of the genome, where do we find SNPs that co-segregate with benign versus malignant phenotype. And here in one study uh, with the colleagues in Texas, we identified a candidate gene on chromosome five, which is called RUP3D, which is a gene that is involved in cell migration. Uh, another group also looked at this wild melanoma and they also did a genome-wide association study. Of course, they found on, on chromosome 21, this peak here, which is x -merc. So these fish in the wild, they have the same tumor driver gene. And then when they look for benign versus malignant, they also end up on chromosome five, but in a totally different region. This peak here on chromosome five has only two genes, which one is UTGRE5, the other one is a fatty acid transporter. And UTGRE5 uh, is a gene that is also in, found in some human cancers and is associated with aggressiveness. And what you can see here that this allele on this fish is inducing a higher proliferation in vitro and uh, is pre and in, from the other fish, it's preventing <laughs> migration. So we have a second candidate gene on the same chromosome. And then we found even a third one on the same chromosome. And this gene is called CDKN2AB. Those, those people who are working on cell division, they know that this is a regulator of cell growth. It's involved in oncogene-induced senescence. What is it? Uh, this is the beauty spot of the platyfish, and this is a beauty spot of humans. These beautiful spots are called nevi, and they are benign tumors of melanocytes. They only rarely turn into malignant and become a melanoma precursor. But you can see in the histology, these cells, these, they are visible today because they are multinucleated. So we can identify them. So the question was, does Xmeric, uh, the spots in the, in the female platyfish, are they also these senescent nice cells, uh, these nevo cells? And indeed, as you can see, they are multinucleated. So we call them fish nevo cells. So we did RNA-seq and found again that there are a lot of senescence genes. So just to remind you what is senescence. Senescence is a similar escape mechanism from transformation, is an exit from the cell cycle. So the, the cells go into the G0 phase. It's not like uh, apoptosis, but these cells, they just sit, they never enter the cell cycle again. They are always multinucleated. And there is a specific staining for that. It's known that this is an escape mechanism for cancer in the benign cells. And again, as I told you, the, the, the Xifophorus spotting cells are, are showing this multicellular phenotype. So we ask, and then you come back to the transgenic medaca. These are the fish which have x alone. And these are the double transgenic fish. So they have x but they express this uh, CDKN, this cancer suppressor gene. And if we do a CRISPR knockout of CDKN, 
is again our x Merck alone cells, and then the, if they ha don't have the CDKN to AB, then they develop these very ugly tumors. Okay, how is senescence mediated? To make a long story short, from proteome analysis, we knew that the genes which are that the proteins which uh, which are important for the metabolism of reactive oxygen species that they are differentially regulated between benign and malignant tumors. And from a series of cell culture experiments, we found from transcriptomes, we found six differentially expressed genes which are linked to this switch to senescence. And one is this cyanase, an enzyme from uh, the glutathione and uh, cysteine metabolism. And we Ask the question, is this metabolism switch really the, the decision? Does it help? And these are cell culture experiments. This is one of these stains for um, senescence. And uh, here are several melanoma cells. And luckily enough, there was already an inhibitor for this enzyme, which was uh, Known, so we use this inhibitor, and as you can see, the number of blue cells, the nascent cells, is increasing, and there is a severe growth reduction under uh, this drug. And when we knock down with SH RNA, when we knock down this enzyme in melanoma cells, then melanoma growth is retarded or even disappearing after transplantation of human melanoma cells into the new mice. Okay, the last two or three slides. Now I'm scratching my head and you also would do it if you remember, how can we have three candidate genes on chromosome five? And what I show you here, this is chromosome five of the platyfish. Here is CDK and two AB, the, the senescence related tumor suppressor. Here is RAP3D, the, my, the, the migration, and this one, also the one which is related to several human tumors. You see, these are more than, this is 12, 13 megabase distance on the same chromosome. How can we make such an error? Yeah, this is one GWAS, this is another GWAS. This was also map. No, this was also mapping and and the candidate approach. And I've shown you in the Medaka how efficient this gene is in killing melanoma. And if we look into this region, you now we find even other interesting genes which we know from human studies and so on that they might be involved in regulating the growth, the migration, the metabolism of the pigment cells. So when the regular genetic doesn't help anymore, then you go and ask if there may be an epigenetic mechanism behind. So what we did, we um, produced methylomes from these different lesions. Here is our, nine, our knockout mutant again, the platyfish with the spots, the benign and the malignant, and we did the regular thing, B-sulfide sequencing, which confirmed our studies by, by doing RNA-seq and attack-seq. And then when we uh, write down and we look for the distribution of CPG methylation per chromosome, we see that chromosome five is somehow uh, falling out. It has a much higher CPG methylation per chromosome than any of the others. So it seems to be that the leakage group five is hyperpigmented in is hypermethylated in the in the benign pigment cell lesions, and uh, when we do um, in a staining, the, you can even see in the interface nuclei there is a spot which indicates that there is a hypermethylated chromosome. And the Indrajit, our friend who is doing all this, he said this looks like. Uh, the bar body. This looks like an inactivated X chromosome of a, of a female nuclear. When he, when he does this with humans, it looks like the same. So obviously, K 
can see a large hypermethylated domain. So we went back and, and did uh, map all the CPGs from our uh, methylome sequencing. And we did this against the chromosomes. Yeah? And as you can see, there is a lot of methylation in the benign tumors. But here, one, the, the poppy is almost uh, not methylated. And also here is there is a lower level. Here, for instance, this is a region where CDKN2B is. And I will, so the chromosome which segregates with the R phenotype is somehow hypermethylated. But the region is much larger than the region to which we or our colleagues map R, which leaves us with the working hypothesis. And this is where we stand. There is an epigenetic regulation of gene expression in pre-malignant pigment cell lesions and melanoma. So it seems that a large piece of this chromosome, which is a tumor suppressor, is methylated. So we think that the true R gene, which still may exist, is kind of a methylation center like cyst on the X chromosome, but here on chromosome five. And if anyone in the room has an idea how to find a methylation center on a chromosome, I'm very happy to discuss with you and uh, share the ideas that we and you might have. And some of my, the people which are still actively working on the project so a lot of the alumni are here are only some of those who did all the signal transduction work. We have a very nice collaboration going on. And here, these are the people who gave the money and I just gave the talk. Thank you. Questions? I'll come around with the mic. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, I have a question about the, 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 the fish itself. That is, the, I don't remember the duplication. Is something very ancient or is specific to Xiphophorus? It's specific to Xiphophorus. It, it happened early in the evolution of this genus. Yeah. And, and my question is, do we have an idea why that is, what is the endogenous function of this gene and why Xiphophorus need an extra copy? of an uh, EGF, modified EGF receptor for, yeah. for uh, melanic cells. Yeah, this is a very good question. And it goes back to the idea of the evolutionary mutant model. Why do they have a, a cancer gene? And the only thing that we can say and what we know is that the situation when we have the tumor gene and the regulator working together, we have these spots, which I said, I call them duty spots. But uh, um, colleagues who are in, uh, in behavioral biology, they've done experiments and they show that if fish have spots, they recognize each other better in murky water so they can swim together, they can school, they can find. And also male in males, the spots are bigger and, and brighter. So there might be even sexual selection for growth of the spots, but of course it's a balance, yeah, so they could not go too far. Yes, yeah, so we think that obviously the regulator, this methylation center or what, or the genes on this chromosome. So this linkage group five is full of genes which are growth suppressors, yeah. And there might be just like alleles, yeah, snips, in, 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 in these genes which are in the, which uh, facilitated. So if there was an x merc duplication in a fish that didn't have the regulator, it would die. But if there were just, let's say stronger alleles of the growth suppressors for pigment cells in such a fish, then the gene could have survived. So we don't know how, how often that can happen. I didn't show our recent studies on the phylogeny of Xiphophorus, but we know that in the early times, 
there has been a lot of hybridization introgression between species. So maybe this event happened several times, but only this one survived, this single event. I have a related question. So in one of your earlier slides, you show this, the, the, the mutant ecmo mm -hmm. fish. So, so they don't have a pigment, but do they have any other problems at all? Or? No, they, they don't have, uh, yeah, we, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, but of course, this is always a question of sensitivity because this mutant lives in our fish room and we are happy because it saved uh, the nature paper and it saved my job. So we feed it well, we treat it well. We don't know if this fish would survive in nature. It's the same problem with a lot of mouse mutants uh, that don't show a phenotype. You know, they might have a lower reproduction rate or it might be less resistant to starving or uh, yeah, traumatization, maybe wound healing is affected, we don't know. Yeah. You, you may have looked at the group uh, five in, uh, in the related species. It's, it's a good question, it's something that we should do. No, we have not done yet. Yeah, there might be all, yeah, we can talk about this just later. It could be a hybrid effect, yeah? That because this chromosome also comes from a different species. And so that is my hypermethylation that we can recognize yeah, or that this extension has. No. It, it's not more temperature, and we've done also uh, looked for that because we've done a taxi, and there are not more promoters, more denser. So it was a, an idea in the beginning, but unfortunately, the hypothesis is not found. I have a question about the hypermutilation with the CPG. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, many, you know, housekeeping gene uh, has a Tata less uh, you know, gene. The uh, CPG Island, like a promoter, it's derived expression. Yeah. The, I wonder whether this is a maturation case is uh, such a housekeeping gene is not expressed. I don't know one. Because uh, I wonder whether the, such a hyper maturation of the CPG area is a uh, uh, also observe in the, such a housekeeping gene? Uh, we have not looked particularly at housekeeping genes, so the classical ones, but of course we, we can could do it because they are in our data set. You, you I wonder be... with us, uh, Milanoma, uh, how about the uh, housekeeping gene regulation is affected? I have to confess that I don't know much about it. I didn't come across that though. The usual thing is that housekeeping genes are somehow neglected because everyone goes to the POL2 uh, regulated genes because they are regulating the cell cycle and so on. Uh, no, maybe we, we, we even don't know. Recently, uh, I also investigated uh, one of the tumor suppressor protein a bump in killer fish. The, my, this mutant uh, my, my usually is uh, in the retina, uh, undergoes apoptosis, p53 dependent. But uh, this my bump mutant also shows a chromosome segregation defect. The actually, bump is a uh, actual factor to bind the CPG island upstream of the housekeeping gene or the mm -hmm. fashion gene, but it's really published in nature. The them, uh, we are, uh, they also show the bump motif. The, our also check the RNA sequence data and appreciation downrelation gene of the bump mutant. The actually bump uh, downrelation gene in the bump mutant has the bump motif, meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, my, I, we are also making such a list. 
。で、全、まあ、セブラル、まあ、セルサイクル、ジニオルソ、コンテインダディスク。そう。ですから、まあ、I'm really wondered the, まあ、まあ、how the such a epigenetics also link to the, you know, and how the housekeeping genes expression is linked to the cancer metastasis. That's a, my, I also wondering so. Yeah, yeah in, very interesting. Yeah, we, we can check our data set like this. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, one back there. Can you read your microphone? Yeah. Just Thank on you. a side note, um, we have sword tails here in Okinawa. Yeah. Unfortunately, as invasive species, so. Yeah. They have conquered Okinawa. <laughs> yeah. Great. So um, there's still a few slots available to, to meet Manfred while he's here. Uh, and there's a tea time tomorrow, isn't there? Tea time at four o'clock. Uh, it's a TS, it's our visiting program tea time at four o'clock tomorrow in the lab five uh, area. So please do come along. Um, but uh, in the meantime, please join me in thanking Manfred for a, a lovely talk. Thank you.